Okay, so as he said, I'm in mechanical engineering. I'm the only one from mechanical engineering speaking today. So I have a slightly different interest than most of the other folks here. So we're going to be talking about graphene and other 2D materials. We saw a great talk earlier today from Wendron talking about electronic devices and optical devices from 2D materials. What really gets me excited as a mechanical engineer is the mechanical properties of 2D materials. So I think everyone here already knows what graphene is. It's a single layer of carbon atoms where if you have graphite, uh, it's a stack of sheets of carbon atoms. You can think of this as you know, a stack of paper and this as a single sheet of paper. And when you pull one of these layers out, then it actually behaves completely differently than the bulk stack of material does. Just like if you take a single piece of paper out of the stack, now all of a sudden it becomes very flexible and uh, uh, pliable. So what we are interested in is, in is a very open-ended question of, well, once you can make these 2D materials, what kinds of new devices can you make, molecular scale devices can you make, using sheets which are only one atom thick? Okay. Uh, and so first question we gotta ask is, okay, well, how strong are these materials? So uh, Graphene, uh, it, what we can do is we can take a sheet of graphene and suspend it over a hole. And we can do nano indentation, where we take an AFM tip and push down on one of these minerals. And just by looking at the response in the AFM tip, we can uh, look at the deflection of the membrane as a function of the force being applied. And eventually, the, as the, the, the load increases, as you bend further, and eventually the membrane breaks. And from the shape of this curve, you can extract mechanical properties of graphene. <coughs> what we find is graphene has a uh, 2D Young's modulus of 340 newtons per meter. And that's equivalent to a 3D Young's modulus of over a gigapascal. And it will break at strains of about 25%. From these numbers, you actually find out that graphene, this one atom thick sheet of carbon, is the strongest material in the world. OK, so as the strongest material in the world, that means there's a lot of meat possibilities of things that we can build out of it. And it makes it so that it's stable under, uh, even if we're doing a lot of really strong perturbations to it. So what are some interesting devices that we can make out of it? Well, we can do things like take this suspended membrane and apply a gas pressure between two sides of the membrane. And you can actually see, when you do this, you'll actually see the membrane will bulge outwards, just like a little balloon. You can measure uh, permeation of the gas through the membrane. We, could find, we found that these, ga these membranes at one atom thick are effectively impermeable to gases. And this is actually very useful because it means that you can actually use this membrane to separate different environments. You can do things like poke holes in it and controllably sieve, mole uh, do molecular sieving or uh, pass things like uh, DNA through nanopores and use it as a, a method for uh, sequencing. You can also do, uh, take this membrane, stretch it out like a drum head. You can use electric fields or uh, lasers to actuate the membrane or, and detect its motion. And we can find that uh, uh, we can actually make these membranes vibrate. You can get, from micron scale membranes, you can get megahertz frequency resonance. You can also do things like take a membrane and rather than stretching it out, you can actually crumple it up or you can pattern it and, and pull on it. So you can do, take ideas from things like kirigami or rippling of membranes and see how, when you pattern it or apply forces, how is it going to be harmful. So as a couple of particular examples of things that are useful for, one is we can take these graphene and use the sheets and use them as nanoelectromechanical systems. So you can wire up a suspended graphene membrane uh, and apply current through it and uh, 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 apply a gate, and you can actually use this gate to tension the membrane by applying electrostatic force, which pulls it down. And as the current passes through the membrane, the graphene is a semi-metal, so the conductivity changes as a function of the, the motion of the graphene. So you can actually use the graphene itself to self-detect its own motion. And because of the atomic scale dimensions, these membranes are extremely tunable. So over here, we can see the resonance frequency tuning as a function of its gate voltage, 
And you can see that the, the membrane, this resonator is tuning by over 100%. And this is actually really interesting because in typical MEMS technologies, tuning is a very difficult thing to achieve. So in most MEMS devices, you can get tuning on the order of one to a few percent. So here we're getting 100%, which means that you could potentially use these in applications where uh, high capability would be useful, like voltage control oscillators. Okay, in a totally different realm, uh, this is a very recent project that we've been working on, where we have some collaborators in Sun Moon Nam's group uh, making crumpled graphene devices. And they can actually crumple the device and then uh, crumple the graphene and then build a device on it. We can find that you can stretch it and contract it by 100% without it breaking. What they noticed is that they, when they shined light on it, they were getting a photo response. And so uh, we decided to see if we could figure out the origin of that. So we built a scanning photo current setup, and here this map set, which allows us to map out the photo response as a function of position. And here you can see that we can actually get a photo response in the graphene membranes right at the electrodes. And as we stretch it, the, the crumpled graphene, the area of photo response moves and it changes in intensity. We can actually map that up, uh, out and uh, it looks like this graphene, the photo response is coming from a photothermal effect, where we can tune it by how crumpled the graphene. Okay, so these are a bunch of mechanical devices made out of graphene, but graphene is only really one material. And the thing that has gotten the, the field really excited in the last couple of years is we realized that there's actually hundreds of different 2D materials, where they can have totally different in-plane molecular structures, would be one or a few atoms thick, but they all share that they have a van der Waals gap that separates layers from each other. And that means that you can actually pull out from any one of these materials and get a monolayer or a few layers that exist stably. And, but from that, if you look at all of these different materials, you basically get all of the properties in material science down at molecular length scale. So some of the materials are metals, some of them are insulators, some of them are semiconductors, we have magnetic materials, spin materials, superconductors, whatever. Okay? So right now the whole our field is sort of exploring what are all the new material properties that are, are emerging from this material class. But it also leads to a really cool idea, which is each one of these materials is stable on its own. And so can't, now we have this possibility where we can actually use them as building blocks, where we can take one material and stack it on another material, and do this over and over again to mix and match and build whatever nanoelectronic device we want, where these uh, layers are all molecular scale dimensions, so we can build molecular scale electronics out of it. The way that we can actually build these heterostructures is very simple. So you can imagine if you have a 2D material, uh, you can use a sticky polymer, peel it off, and under a microscope, you can move it around and align it so it's sitting over another 2D material. You stick the two together, you heat it up a little bit, that changes the stickiness of the polymer, and you can peel the polymer off, leave the 2D material there. And now all of a sudden, you have a heterostructure. So this is the first uh, demonstration of this, where you can put graphene on boron nitride, which is an insulated 2D material. But you can just repeat this process over and over again and make any arbitrary structure you want. So here, for example, is a cross-section uh, TEM image where you can see we have boron nitride, molybdenum disulfide, graphene, and boron nitride all sandwiched together. This structure represents a Schottky junction, where graphene is the metal, MOS2 is a semiconductor, and the BN is a dielectric. The interesting thing about this versus other techniques for building nanoscale 2D systems, like MBE, for example, is there is no actual requirement that the different layers have any atomic registry with respect to each other. And we can fa fabricate them independently and combine them later. Okay, so as one particular example of the kind of device we can build, what we wanted to do is take two different 2D materials, molybdenum disulfide, and stack it on top of tungsten diselenide. 
Here you can see there's one material stacked on top of the other, and then we just built electrodes using EV lithography to attach to the different layers. You can do transport through the molybdenum disulfide. You can see it's an N-type semiconductor. If you do transport through the tungsten disulfide, then you see it's a P-type semiconductor. So now, with this same set of electrodes, we can do transport from molybdenum disulfide into tungsten disulfide, or the other way around. And you can see, here we have that, as a function of the gate voltage. You can see that for certain values of gate voltage, we're getting dialed <coughs> behavior, whereas for other values, it's uh, turning off. And we can associate that with, uh, we're just tuning the Fermi energy inside of a junction, where these two materials effectively form a type 2 heme junction. So what we're forming is a electrostatically tunable diode molecular scale diode. And you're like, well, okay, that's cool. But if you think about it a little bit further, this diode does not operate the way traditional diodes do. Because traditional diodes, you have uh, two materials, bulk materials attached, and there's a depletion region, which can be on the scale of a few hundred nanometers of the interface. And yet, in this material, the, materi the interface, the whole structure is less than two nanometers thick. So that tells us that, uh, um, uh, the physics is entirely different, where it's more of a, a charge transfer process between molecules. Okay, so one last thing before I'm done, which is, okay, it's really neat and useful to be able to uh, uh, play with these two materials, but we want to be able to also have reliable methods for making them. So, over the last few years, we've been working on different methods for large-scale synthesis of these materials. This has been very successful with graphene, people are growing graphene by the meter, We've also had some success in growing single layer materials like molybdenum disulfide. Uh, with these materials, one thing that's very important, anybody who grows materials can tell you, often it's the defects which dominate behavior, not the, uh, not the uh, uh, intrinsic uh, regions of the material. So we've been also studying what do the atomic scale defects do and, and how do they impact the material properties. So, for example, we can actually, a unique thing that we can do with 2D materials is because they're atomically thin, we can do, put them inside of a TEM and we can get single atom imaging of the defect structures inside of it. So here you can see a grain boundary in graphene, you can see a grain boundary in molybdenum disulfide. Those are atom by atom imaging of those defect structures. And once we know where those defects are, we can directly relate them to optical, electrical, and mechanical properties. So one thing we're doing right now is to uh, take the next step and not just try to grow one or two materials, but try to develop a vapor-based method for growing 2D materials. So we just installed a new furnace, where it, which uses uh, uh, all the techniques from metal organic synthesis and vapor-based synthesis, and we're hoping that that's going to give us vast improvements in the scalability and reliability of these materials. Uh, 2D materials, but also give us the ability to grow new materials as well as things like gradients, alloys, and heterostructures. And once we have these new materials, you know, now we have uh, the ability to take our experience with mechanics on graphene as well as these electronic, optoelectronic devices of heterostructures and integrate those ideas together and start thinking about what kinds of new 3D nanosystems can we start making when we start combining mechanics and heterostructures together. So, thank you.